I just want to say three brief things about our relationship with God and how money might be part of that today. And the first is that money should never be the thing that comes between us and God. Money shouldn't be the thing that comes between us and God. There's a story about a rich young ruler that comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Are we okay? Yes, I was just wondering if the client wanted to No, it's okay. I think they're all right. Yeah. Okay. So a young ruler comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus doesn't pull any punches. He says to that young ruler, he says, You must go, give everything away. Give all you have to the poor. Sounds a really difficult thing to do. A really challenging thing to do. Maybe it seems like an impossible thing to do. But maybe Jesus had looked into that person's heart and recognised the thing that was becoming between him and God was his money. The money was more important than his relationship with God. If he wanted a full living relationship with God, if he wanted to experience God in all God's fullness, then he needed to sort out his priorities. The money in itself isn't wrong. It's the love of the money that can be wrong at times. And if that's the problem, then we need to sort it out. Thinking about money, thinking about how we give money, is a challenge for each one of us in our Christian lives. How much we give will depend on our circumstances, what's going on for us. When we decide what we give to God, then first of all we need to decide where our priorities are, how we spend our money, what are the different areas of our life that we use money for, how much do we need to give to God and support the work of his kingdom. And for each of us, those, that time of discernment will be different and it changes at different times in our lives. Early on in our marriage, Sarah and I went to a Christian convention, Easter People, that used to take place. And we went to a talk that was all about Christian giving. And we felt challenged in that talk to take up tithing as part of our Christian giving, the way that we would give to God, giving 10% of our income to God. And I don't say that to make us seem good. That's just something that has worked for us over the years. And the thing that struck me in that talk was, even if you give 10% directly to God and to charity and the church, which is what we've done, you still have 90% that you then need to decide how you're going to use that for God as well. For each of us, our giving will be different. But we need to pray. We need to reflect. We need to think about what's right for us. We need to make sure our giving is regular and committed. Giving to God should be the first call on our income, not what's left over at the end of the week. Money should never be think the thing that comes between us and God. And then secondly, money should be seen as an opportunity, an opportunity to do good and to transform lives. What a privilege having money is. Jesus encounters someone else for whom money is a problem, the wonderful man Zacchaeus. As you might imagine, I like the story of Zacchaeus. Any story in which somebody small comes out good in the end is great for me. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and he was a cheating tax collector. And he was miserable and he was lonely because of his job and because nobody liked him. But he encounters Jesus and he's challenged and he's changed and he's transformed. He gives money away. He pays people back in excess of what he's taken from them. He realises what grace is all about. He experiences what it's like to give with joy without counting the cost. Our money is a fantastic resource for doing good, to transform lives, to give joyfully and see the difference that giving can make. An opportunity to transform lives. And then thirdly, money is an opportunity to be generous. Jesus embodies generosity in the way that he lived his life. 
in his ministry, in his teaching, in his time for others, in his very life itself and the way that he gives his life on the cross. It's all about generosity. So when he encounters the poor woman in the temple, who's giving those few coins, but it's all that she has, he upholds her as someone who's given with great generosity because she's given from all that she has. Alongside her are others who are putting in really big amounts with a lot of fuss and pomp. But she's the one that's truly being generous. She's not given from what's extra or what's left over. She's given sacrificially. And Jesus upholds her as an example to us all. Because when we give, we give in response to what God has first given to us. God's blessed us in many ways. In that reading from Deuteronomy, we're reminded how for the Israelites, they were challenged to give their first fruits, to give the best of what they had to God, to give it in an offering to him. Giving should always be the result of careful and prayerful reflection. We should respond thankfully and cheerfully in giving to God, to allow, to follow his ways, to work for his kingdom. It says in 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So next time the collection comes around, let's see lots of really big smiles. We can see in Jesus' encounters, in his experiences, that time and again he challenges people about money and about their giving. He wants to see people living their lives to the full, having the best that life can bring making a difference, using their money wisely and generously, and not simply counting the cost to themselves. He wants people to see that money actually isn't the most important things in their lives. To think about their priorities, to love God first and foremost, to put him as their priority, and allow that love to transform every other part of their lives. So three challenges about giving. And when we think about giving, when we think about any subject in church, there's often more questions arise than answers. There are lots of ways we can give to God. I've just focused a bit on finance today. There's lots of other important challenges. What, how do we use the money that we keep for ourselves? How do we make sure our spending is done in a way that glorifies God and his world? How do we spend and invest in ways that are ethical, good for our neighbours, good for our planet, not just our own interests? How do we decide whether to give to church or to charity? How does the church use its income wisely and justly? Whenever we look at any subject, there are more questions than answers. Maybe there are other questions for us to come back to on another day or for us to go away and reflect on. I just want to finish this part of our service with a challenge. I want you to use your imaginations for a moment. I want you to imagine a church where the problem was not balancing the books, but what we do with the surplus at the end of the year. When we didn't simply worry about upkeep and maintenance, but were excited about the resources that we had for mission and outreach. Where we didn't need to raise money to keep going, but were able to dream dreams about how we could serve God and our community in effective mission and outreach. Where we can't afford it became a thing of the past and living thankfully and generously is central to our Christian discipleship. Maybe my natural optimism is getting a bit carried away there, but with God, I believe nothing is impossible. There's a story about a minister and his congregation the minister stands in front of the congregation one Sunday morning and he says, this morning I have two pieces of bad news and one piece of good news. The first piece of bad news is the church roof needs replacing. The good news is that we have all the money to do it. The second piece of bad news is it's still in your pockets, purses and bank accounts. <laughs> We've got all we need to do amazing things for God. We just need to hand them over to him. Amen.